Uh, good morning, Bula. Welcome, everyone. My name is Patrick Earle. I'm the executive director of the Diplomacy Training Programme, which is an NGO uh, affiliated with the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales in Australia. I'm joining you today from Sydney and would like to begin with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land I'm on, um, the Indigenous peoples, the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, their elders past and present, and to recognise that this land continues to be their land. Um, and also in acknowledging the traditional owners and the Indigenous peoples here to recognise the rights of Indigenous peoples their role as custodians of the land and seas and as environmental and human rights defenders is very relevant to our discussions and to this workshop overall. I'd like to also to begin by thanking the organizer of the workshop, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the UN Environment Pro uh, UN UNEP, UN Environmental Programme, and to congratulate them on this initiative. In many countries and parts of the world, the environmental and human rights movements have grown along different paths, using different laws and approaches, different methodologies. But increasingly, we see how these paths have been converging, coming together and intertwining for our planet and its peoples. We have a wonderful uh, panel of speakers here with us today who will represent some of these different strands. Mason, Winnie, Luke, and Lagapoiva, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. This session is very relevant to the work we do in the diplomacy training program, um, which has now been going for 30 years. And I think since the beginning, um, we have had environmental and human rights defenders on our program. It was interesting to hear in the opening session reference to uh, the struggle of the people of Bougainville uh, as they were defending their environment um, and it became a struggle for self-determination um, and how it brought together uh, struggles for human rights, the environment, self-determination, peace um, and we had we, the diplomacy training programs had participants from Bougainville over those last 30 years of our work but we have seen an increasing number of environmental human rights defenders coming on up to our programs to learn how to use international human rights law, to use the UN mechanisms as tools for justice, tools for change. Um, and we see that they are increasingly on the front line of the climate crisis. In some cases, they're trying to stop the coal mining that the world leaders have just agreed, agreed at the G7 meeting in England uh, over the last day or so. They've all agreed that that coal mining must stop. In other cases, these human rights defenders are saving the forests that the world and science has agreed we need. Yet they are doing so at great personal risk to themselves. So we have a very good panel for this uh, first session of this important workshop. We will be drawing out the links between human rights and the climate crisis with the focus on the role of human rights defenders um, and environmental human rights defenders and drawing on some of the perspectives from some of the organizations and movements in the Pacific that these linked crises are bringing together. Environmental and conservation movements, human rights and anti-poverty campaigners. It's an important time for this discussion as momentum grows for action on the climate emergency and the need grows for us to put human rights at the heart of that action and also find new ways of working together. So we're going to organize this session in a series of presentations. Um, and we hope out of those presentations that we will find good intersections for dialogue, that we will have time for questions and discussion. Uh, I should say at the beginning that uh, the workshop is being conducted under Chatham House rules. So while the content of what is being said can be shared and we hope is shared, uh, there should be no attribution to individual speakers and, and what they've said. should say at the same time that the session is being recorded. Um, and when you contribute to the discussion, please use the chat room. We can, we hope, go to you also so we can hear your voice and see you. Um, if you would like to say your name and your attribution when you're making your contribution, please, please feel free to do so, but don't feel compelled to do so either. Um, so... 
we would like this to be a, a good and safe space for discussion. So having said that, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mason Smith, who is the Regional Director of the International Union for the Conservation of, Nat uh, of Nature. He's, uh, uh, and he's the Regional Director for Oceania. He's based in Suva, Fiji, and he's responsible for the overall management and uh, direction of IUCN, IUCN's programme in the Pacific. Uh, so very few other people better qualified to speak on this issue, and he'll he'll lead us in, um, giving us an overview of uh, IUCN's work in relation to environmental human rights defenders, the environmental challenges they're facing, and the human rights challenges they're facing in the region. I think we give a, set up this this session very well. So, uh, Mason, thank you for joining us this morning. We look forward very much to hearing from you. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Uh, for those uh, words of introduction. I'm not too sure whether I'm uh, properly placed to uh, talk about um, human rights or, or environment in the law, but I think I've got some backing. Um, one of my legal staff um, is also on the call, so she'll be able to uh, help me out in that respect. But first of all, just to again thank the uh, organizers who are bringing us together this morning to discuss and to share opportunities uh, in a common area. But uh, more importantly, to perhaps look at some of the areas of partnerships that we can forge uh, going forward. Uh, we had an um, interesting session this morning um, when the first speakers talked about the right to a healthy environment, uh, this issue being uh, intergenerational. Uh, but more importantly, not only looking at climate change, but other factors uh, that affect the rights of our citizens, like uh, pollution and waste management and the issues surrounding uh, biodiversity. What I wanna do this morning is basically uh, in one slide uh, show you uh, uh, what IUCN does in terms of working in the uh, human rights environmental law uh, sector, and then uh, touch on some of our global response to the uh, environmental human rights challenges that we face globally. Uh, and then drill down into uh, the region and what uh, the IUCN regional office is doing uh, to assist um, our countries, our communities respond uh, to the climate crisis. So if you could just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I just wanna alert uh, and show um, you if you're not uh, uh, familiar with uh, what IUCN uh, does. We were created way back in 1948 we're a diverse unit uh, made up of state members and non-state members. Uh, and we have uh, official observer status at the United Nations. This gives us a pathway into some of the global discussions on um, human rights um, and environmental defenders, not only globally, but here in the region. But what's more important is we have uh, six expert commissions or scientists or practitioners one of which is the World Commission on Environmental Law. This is the uh, commission that basically does our environmental law work uh, from um, that angle. We also have the Environmental Law Center uh, in Bonn, Germany, that is basically the headquarters for all our environmental work. Here in the Oceania region, we have the Pacific Center for Environmental Governance which is currently manned by a senior environmental law officer. Uh, and I will talk about the work of the Pacific Center for Environmental Governance uh, later on in the slides. But from an IUCN perspective, um, human rights, um, uh, environmental law uh, go hand in hand. If I can have the next slide, please. Globally, uh, IUCN is working with a number of partners uh, to articulate a very strong call uh, in the conservation community to ensure the protection of uh, environmental human rights defenders. And this is at the heart of what we're trying to achieve in the uh, post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Despite some of our major efforts, you know, uh, IUCN continues to document uh, abuses um, 
right around the uh, the globe and um, you know there's quite a lot of blind spots and gaps that remain we won't play you the video that uh, is shown there on the slide but if you have time after the presentation have a look at it uh, these are testimonials from across the globe on some of the uh, environmental defenders uh, on the abuse that they continue to face on a daily basis as they carry out their peaceful work in trying to defend the environment. So I would encourage you, um, if you have time after the sessions today, uh, click on the link that's provided and listen to some of the uh, harrowing uh, testimonials uh, right across the globe on uh, environmental defenders and the work that they do. Next slide, please. From a global uh, perspective, um, some of you may recall um, that way back in 2019, there was a landmark uh, United Nations General Assembly resolution uh, from the Human Rights Council, specifically addressing the protection needs of our human rights uh, environmental defenders. And the wording of the um, uh, landmark resolution is there, recognizing the contribution of environmental human rights defenders to the enjoyment of human rights environment protection and sustainable development. And I think this goes back to what Sefa was saying this morning about access to the environment, uh, free and prior informed consent, uh, access to decision-making and the sustainable use of resources, uh, including food and water. I think uh, the other important one is the upcoming um, IUCN World Conservation Congress. There is a landmark resolution, resolution 39, which is now calling for the conservation community um, to be able to protect uh, environmental human rights and people's right defenders and whistleblowers. And uh, if I have time, I will circulate the uh, resolution that you can read for yourself. But it's an interesting development uh, born out of the UN uh, General Assembly resolution we are now taking resolution 39 to the uh, World Conservation Congress, which will be held in Marseille, France in September this year. With regards to the next steps on the, um, uh, the film that you saw, uh, the, I mean, that you're going to see when you have time, it's called the Geneva Roadmap. And those are the four uh, action goals that they have uh, uh, planned for themselves. One is to reverse the tide of marginalization and attacks against uh, environmental actors right across the globe, uh, reinforce environmental rights, enabling uh, civic spaces and accountability, like the very space that we now have to discuss uh, these issues, uh, bridge initiatives and enhance cooperation right across the globe, and then try and break the isolation and secure effective access to uh, protection for our human rights. Uh, defenders. This just again shows uh, the outcome of the uh, <clears throat> the Geneva Roadmap, and uh, as one of our speakers mentioned this morning, um, in 2019 there was 212 land and environmental defenders that were killed, and that's uh, 212 too many. And I think the onus is on us uh, in the region and right across the globe to uh, put a stop to these killings. That is basically some of the re, uh, global works that we're doing. In the next slide, if I could have the next slide, please, is some of the work that IUCN is doing in the region. Okay, we work with uh, our countries, our member countries, uh, NGOs and communities uh, in the uh, Pacific Island countries to implement sound environmental projects uh, on the ground. And one of the ways that we um, ensure that this is done is by following um, the IUCN's environment and social management system, which uh, protects uh, the projects that we plan and implement. <clears throat> one of the areas that we are currently uh, working on uh, is the uh, Environmental Law Association. As you will recall, uh, some of you may recall, the Pacific Center for Environmental Governance uh, over the past years has established uh, the Environmental Law Associations in Fiji uh, 
Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu. And we have been funded by the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund to uh, build some of the capacities of these associations as we try and reach out to their countries, uh, not only to the association members, but to empower the communities to be able to protect their own natural resources. Unfortunately, this funding will come to an end um, this year in December, and we are now looking for other funds to ensure the long-term sustainability of our support to the environmental law associations in these four countries. Ah, there you go, sorry, yeah. As I mentioned, the IUCN Pacific Center for Environmental Governance uh, provides support to the four environmental law associations in those four countries. And we will continue to uh, provide support for them uh, as long as funding uh, is available. The other area of support that we are providing is a recent one. Uh, we have reached out to the um, uh, Center for Environment Law and Community Rights in Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is a public interest environment litigation organization. And we have signed, uh, uh, the organization has signed an MOU with the Oro province uh, to work to address some of the illegal logging issues uh, in the Oro province. Uh, as we heard this morning from uh, Sefa and uh, Saini on the uh, issues in Bougainville, uh, we are hoping that this MOU will prevent um, some of the uh, developments that had occurred in Bougainville so that we do not repeat the same mistakes and go down the path that uh, Bougainville went down with regards to mining. Uh, but in this case, it is addressing uh, illegal logging in the Oro province. So we are working um, with uh, uh, the uh, Center for Environment, Law and Community Rights in Papua New Guinea. And it's something that uh, we look forward to in the coming months. Just to uh, wrap up my last two uh, slides, I think um, the second last uh, bullet point there is uh, an example of the one of the risks that we see um, for our environmental defenders uh, uh, risks. Uh, if you recall in the papers, uh, there was an incident here in Fiji on board a fishing vessel. We have uh, fisheries observers. Uh, six observers went missing way back in 2017. Um, someone talked about the Kiribati uh, National that was found dead in 2020. And there are perhaps many more uh, undocumented uh, incidents. But not only uh, is uh, fishing a, a risky business from an environmental defender's perspective, we also, as I mentioned, uh, mining, uh, an interesting development is now occurring uh, in East Fresnel. And I think uh, UNESCO and the World uh, Heritage, the illegal logging and mining issues on uh, East Fresnel. And I think. Uh, Sefa also mentioned it in passing uh, this morning. In addition to those uh, risks, I think some of the other risks uh, include uh, the very sensitive topic of deep sea mining uh, that uh, you know, keeps cropping up every now and then in the region. And to my last slide to uh, round off the uh, presentation this morning, just to alert uh, our uh, 49 uh, participants um, that are connecting virtually this morning, the Pacific Center for Environmental Governance will be hosting the inaugural uh, IUCN Oceania Environmental Law Conference from the 14th to the 16th of July. And uh, registration is now open uh, with the link provided at the bottom of the slide. So if you are interested, uh, please do register. Uh, the point of contact at the Pacific Center for Environmental Governance is uh, Ms. Maria Murvesi. And I'm sure she is also linked in to the discussions this morning. Uh, colleagues, that's an overview of uh, IUCN's work in this space. Um, the various uh, environmental law centers that we have, our commissions, our environmental law unit in Bonn, and the Pacific Center for Environmental Governance here in the region. Plus our global work, and more importantly, some of the work that we're doing here in the region. Thank you very much and uh, good night, Kavakalevi.
Tanaka, thank you very much, Mason. That was really helpful. It's it's uh, it, it's very useful to get the mapping out of of uh, IUC, IUCN's work and uh, different processes, uh, organisations that you're supporting, but also the opportunities to to link in uh, going forward. I think, and we are very happy to share through our own uh, channels the information about the upcoming conference on environmental law, in the region, um, and we'll I think share the your powerpoint presentation and there was the opportunity to have a look at the videos but i think it is through this process of getting to know each other's work that we can build relationships and, and links for the future in that regard it's my great pleasure also to then in, um, introduce our next speaker uh winnie winnie ferretti nanoka from the who's the environmental spe specialist and the department team leader with the undp's pacific office uh, she's been at the UNDP since 2012 and is currently the environmental specialist and team leader for resilience and sustainable development, looking after nine Pacific Island countries um, and 14 Pacific Island countries for regional programs. Before joining uh, UNDP, when he was the head of school of general studies uh, from 2003 to 2009 at the Fiji Institute of Technology now part of the Fiji National University and uh, Winnie is going to share with us experiences uh, in relation to environmental human rights defenders in other regions looking at the causes of, of uh, marginalization and the ne negative impacts uh, on human rights defenders uh, arising from power imbalances the marginalization of indigenous peoples lack of transparency um, and linking it especially now to current processes around climate change and their impacts so Winnie thank you very much for joining us this morning um, and we're looking very forward very much to uh, your presentation and from another house within the within the UN system it's great to hear from you so thank you thank you very much the UN Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner for giving me this opportunity uh, he, he um, thank you so much for your organization and uh, all protocols observed um, and also Earl, uh, firstly I want to say how touched uh, I am by your acknowledgement of the indigenous people and um, uh, similar to what uh, um, Mason has said, I don't think I'm the best place person to talk on human rights uh, defenders, but I'm taking this opportunity to shed some light on traditional ecological knowledge. Before I was given an opportunity to explore more into, um, uh, into uh, traditional ecological knowledge, I really thought it was a very narrow area. Uh, I'm sorry to say that as an indigenous person, and um, I really didn't place much emphasis on it. But today I'll take the opportunity to shed some light on that and explain why uh, indigenous people, uh, they have a passion to defend their rights to ecosystems and a whole lot of uh, other things uh, pertaining to their social ecological systems. So, and secondly, uh, there's a question in the box by VJ, and I want to acknowledge the 20 colleagues from UNDP that are in this call because uh, this work of um, a prior informed consent and all that is very important in our um, 100 plus projects that we have from the Pacific office of UNDP in Fiji. And a lot of them go directly into the communities. So I will not even read what I'm going to start to share, uh, which um, Earl has already read out. And it's there in that uh, first page. Um, next page. First, we'll look at the UND uh, uh, IRP and a few articles. I just chose one article than TEK. So for those of you who haven't uh, known the full depth of TEK, um, I spent about uh, four to six years at Massey University doing this. 
and it was exciting for me. It made me, I'm sorry to say, appreciate my identity after um, a science background. And the practical way forward, uh, practical steps forward, I hope that will help you, VJ. And um, COVID-19, that is my parting shot. So the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, this is adopted in the General Assembly 13th September 2007. It's very comprehensive. And what is the purpose? The universal framework for minimum standards for survival, dignity, and well being of Indigenous people of the world, and etc. I just chose one article. This, this came from Article 24. And it says indigenous people have a right to their traditional medicines to maintain their health practices, including conservation of their vital medicinal plants, animals, and minerals. Now, these medicines could come, you know, the ecosystem services, it could come from the sea, or it could come from the forest, or it could come from uh, animals uh, themselves. So, um, the whole notion, you know, the whole notion of leaving no one, or no one behind is a, is a slogan. This is um, a comment by this uh, special rapporteur at the Rights of Indigenous People. And he says, but if you look at from the Indigenous perspective, we are hardly mentioned. And I want to offer over here, there was a study uh, by uh, 40 Indigenous peoples from all over the world. I was also blessed to be included there, where we look at the SDGs and see where the, ref the um, indigenous people's notions of well-being are captured in the SDGs. I don't know whether I'm putting myself in danger here as a, um, an employee of the UN, but we found there was very little. So when the next Gs are formed, you know, MDGs, SDGs, when the next set of Gs are formed, I hope that they will um, also take into consideration the indigenous people's views. So look at the yellow highlighted there. We are one of the most affected by diversity, often best situated. We are best situated. And that is what we must remember when we do our development partners work at the community, we just go in, help them, and they help us put in place uh, sustainable um, methods of conservation and sustainable use of natural resources. And because when we move out, it's them that carry on the work. So, and that, it leads us into the next bit of tr uh, traditional ec uh, ecological knowledge. There's so many descriptions of this in uh, textbooks. And we have secret books, which I liked the best. And um, it talks about um, knowledge, practice, and belief. You know, and this is behind, you see, indigenous human rights defenders. This is uh, the, on the basis of what they are looking at. I tried to just classify it into these four during my studies, uh, four main areas of values and beliefs. And this is how uh, these value statements in every indigenous um, uh, people's uh, cultures, they reflect of how things should be. It could be a statement or it could be just a simple word. Like for Fijians, we talk about element to and also wisdom. Uh, it it uh, denotes wisdom. There's no wastage when you start to use environmental resources. All parts of the tree are used. The uh, tree people in North America, they process all of the animals insides and um, and the outside and every part of the animal, just like a coconut tree is used and we talk about sacred grounds. You do not need the police to keep you away from sacred grounds. You keep away from there because of your values, indigenous values and beliefs. Sites of traditional cultural significance. 
of cultural keystone species, totems, every Fijian, for instance, you have a plant, you have a fish, and you have an animal. And you can use as developers, use this to on the, the basis of your um, development work. The practices that we have, some of these, oops, going back, uh, some of these practices are very sustainable. You know, we use spears, fish traps, even the traditional uh, nettings, the mesh size of sustainable, uh, denotes sustainability. Believes in uh, when you do waste, like if you leave your waste on the ground, some indigenous people of the Pacific believe that your crops will not be as fat. Your ndalo will not be as fat. Why? Because the waste has eaten the flesh of the ndalo. And of course, planting methods, uh, taro, the raised beds, that you have a special tool, tools. And with the raised bed, you reduce the nematode populations and it has high organic content. The skills, for instance, in Fiji, we are classified. In a village, you have carpenters, you have fishermen, you have warriors, you have chiefs, you have a chief spokesman. And all of this, like I come from a fisherman tribe and um, we are, um, our roles in the village is denoted by this. This is sustainability. Not everybody farms, not everybody fishes. In the presence of the traditional uh, warriors, I cannot eat fish and they cannot eat pork. You know, all our lifestyles are based on this and we do not need legislation to tell us uh, uh, what to do or how to do it. And finally, knowledge and a whole lot of knowledge, indigenous knowledge are out there and these can be merged with, I'm not talking about incorporation into, but merge this scientific Western knowledge and we get, it's like a marriage and we get the best of uh, both worlds. Not one is superior over the other, but when we do our community work, we must acknowledge this because they, the indigenous people are in situ. We come in with our dollars and we go out. If we put all our ideas there, our, our projects will die. It has to be uh, believed and it has to have a, uh, a sense of acceptance from the people on the ground. So the practical steps to push for recognizing the rights of the indigenous people of the world, focus on priorities. And um, this is talking about some of those that had already been mentioned by Earl about uh, the people uh, having their own uh, uh, own power for self-determination. Number two, include indigenous people in discussions of ecosystems use. Why? Because ecosystems and indigenous people are entwined. You take out one, the indigenous people uh, without their consultation, when without their land, their land and their ecosystem, it's part of them. And that's why we must have the principle of free prior and informed consent um, practice, especially in UNDP where we now have the SCSP as being very, um, it's, it's a requirement and yet it also includes this. Apply the law to ensure that uh, land rights are protected and not flouted and there's an example there it was legislated and seems that like some Brazilian Indian tribes are still waiting and uh, you see them camping by the roadsides. And of course, uh, they're trying to reoccupy uh, small pieces of their land. Number four, build pu a public awareness. I hope I'm doing this here to explain the passion, to give you a little class of TEK, what it's all about. It's not narrow, it's values, it's beliefs, it's practices, and it's embedded usually in the kinship systems also. Village between village, in the districts, or even in provincial and nation. Recognize their role in conservation. This is a sure shot for failure. 
if we just go in with our own, own um, ideas and projects and we move up. No, they have already, the indigenous peoples, you know, you might have some variation to cope with the increasing consequences of climate change. But what they do on the ground and they know the ecosystems best must be recognized and respected. Bridge the gap between policy and practice. We talk about marine protected areas in Fiji. We do not usually um, encourage legislation. Why? Because once it's legislated, the people themselves are barred from fishing in their own areas, own golingolis. So there are gaps, uh, gaps at, that exist at every level and Palanoa talking from all levels to put in place policies that are good for all from the community to cabinet. Encourage the state to fulfill wider rights. I'm glad for Chatham rules because I'm going to say this, you know, a lot of times when we talk about human rights, people think it's racism. No, it is not. There are certain people there that are indigenous and they have this TEK and they are important for your conservation work that must be recognized. So TEK, indigenous people's rights are not racism. And do not try to speak for indigenous people. I myself cannot go back to my village where one of my cousins told me, you think you're a professor from the university? We are the professors of nature in our village. And I recognize that because I cannot go and survive in the village happily for one month like they do and vice versa. So thank you and learn from stories of progress from how people have defended their territory and their own vision for self-government all over the world. Finally, I just, this is on another angle. This is what is happening right now in Fiji. We talk about values, you know, and they are saying, stay away, social distances, keeping people tend to a funeral. And what is happening? Funeral are being talked about now as the primary um, spreading um, uh, occurrence for COVID. Why? Because we are told only 20 people. And in the Pacific, you know that when somebody dies, this is your last opportunity to go and say goodbye. And that is what's causing COVID at the moment. It's uh, firstly, it's uh, very sad that uh, we, the indigenous people um, in the communities, we have uh, poor access to healthcare, and et cetera. But in the second bullet point, our lifestyles, because of our traditional ecological knowledge, our values and beliefs, we cannot, we sneak into the funeral. And what happens, government says only 10, there's a hundred people there. 20 standing on the hill, 20 at the graveside, 20 in the house, that's all about values. And it's even putting up, uh, putting us at risk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Winnie, that was terrific. And, uh... It's very powerful and I think also for many of us um, a very a very rich expression of why Pacific voices need to be heard also on the global stage when we're considering climate change and the importance of ensuring that Indigenous peoples are able and safe to share their, their knowledge and what they have to contribute to the discussions around uh, climate change how we respond and unless we act to ensure the rights of indigenous peoples we will not have effective responses to climate change you introduced many different things to us i think in that session including um for those of us from outside the pacific the importance of the talanoa the importance of dialogue and talking getting together and sharing knowledge uh, so thank you again we'll come back i think you can see the level of interest there was in your session from the chat room please keep adding everybody to the chat room and the questions and we'll come to those. First though we'll move to Luke, uh, Dr Luke Fletcher who's the Executive Director of um, Jubilee Australia which is an NGO that works very closely with Pacific communities with Indigenous peoples in the Pacific around the impacts on their environment, their livelihoods, their traditional knowledge 
It has a focus on the impacts, particularly of Australian companies and corporations in the Pacific and works with those communities to try and bring accountability um, for, um, for the impacts of corporations uh, working to find justice. Dr. Luke Fletcher has worked very closely with communities, including in Bougainville, uh, but across the Pacific on these issues. And it's great that you can join us, Luke. Um, so thank you and, and look forward to hearing from you. A very different perspective, I think, from outside of the system in a way, um, but please. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Patrick, for that introduction. And I think you've, you've introduced um, um, Jubilee Australia's work really well, so I probably don't have to do that. Um, again, again, uh, I'd like to reiterate um, uh, my gratitude for um, for the organisers of of the conference, um, which is is such an important um, issue that we're discussing, and we discussed it last these issues last year in, in I think it was December, and it's really good to continue that conversation. Uh, like Patrick, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country where I live and work, which is the Gadigal people of the Euro nation um, and the ongoing contribution to culture of their elders past and present. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, I'm, uh, our organisation is based in Sydney in, in, in New South Wales, uh, but we work very closely, particularly um, in the Pacific region, um, looking at the, uh, with, you know, with, with very much an interest in the, in the role that Australian corporations and government policies have um, on communities and countries overseas, especially in the Pacific. Uh, so I'd like to sort of pick up on three themes, um, uh, 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 but sort of maybe drilling down a little bit um, in more detail on some of the issues that our previous speakers, Mason and Winnie, have, have mentioned with respect to the Pacific and um, human rights defenders and climate change. The first theme that I want to discuss or unpack a bit more is the, um, I guess, the most pertinent example of frontline communities in the Pacific who are actually fighting for climate justice and for an alternative future right here and now. And so frontline communities are often um, at the coalface of halting the sorts of behaviors that are ex specifically exacerbating climate change. And the, the best example I think of that is um, the fight against the imposition of a coal sector in Papua New Guinea by the Australian company Maya Resources in league with uh, some politicians and political elements in PNG. So uh, I'm just going to share, I, I don't have a PowerPoint, I'm just going to share my screen a couple of times with some, um, some websites that I think will be helpful for people to, um, to take a look at. So, um, so yes, if you, if you want to, um, have a look at this website while I'm talking. Um, so the, 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 the No Good Coal Coalition, no, which means um, no coal in Papua New Guinea, is a coalition between uh, indigenous organizations in, 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 in Papua New Guinea, or sorry, I should say Papua New Guinea based organizations like CELCOR, the, the Center for Environmental Law and Human Rights, um, ourselves at Jubilee, um, uh, the original group called No Good Coal and others who are fighting um, for to prevent the establishment of this coal sector in PNG. It's obviously, um, well, I can only really, I, I hate to use overly emotive language, but it really is outrageous that um, we should be having this discussion in these times um, that uh, a major Pacific nation is, is really considering implementing a coal sector. Uh, you know, the big question of this campaign that we're asking is why does PNG need dirty polluting coal when it has so many opportunities for renewable energy, especially in, in the hydro and solar power sectors. And it already gets a lot of its energy from solar power, uh, from hydropower. Solar power is a really growing opportunity there. And it really doesn't need um, new coal mines or a new coal fired power station. So there's an attempt by this company and by, um, as I said, certain politicians to to build a coal-fired power station in, in Ley, uh, which is the second biggest city in Papua New Guinea and one of obviously the largest uh, cities in the Pacific. Uh, not only um, are there the um, 
concerns about the climate impacts, but the health impacts of a 50 or, or even larger megawatt power station right on the doorstep of PNG's second largest city, um, very serious impacts for, um, for health and um, in particularly with regards to the air pollution and the and health impacts of the air pollution um, from burning coal on that city. So as I said, we're, we're working with our partners, CELCOR, Centre for Environmental Law and Community Rights, and Winnie mentioned them um, earlier, um, um, and um, into the, um, uh, we're also looking at the attempts to mine coal in the Gulf Province of PNG. So there's a plan by the company to start some coal mines in Gulf Province, um, as well as their plans in Morobu Province. So, um, other groups such as Pacific Climate Warriors um, have been helping us with this, um, with this, with this fight. And also, I, I would say that uh, Pacific Climate Warriors, um, Patrick, unable to join us today, but um, in a general sense, are also very much part of uh, the Pacific-wide, very much youth-led campaign to prevent Australia itself um, further polluting the planet and. Um, really arguing very strongly for Australia to wean itself off its addiction to fossil fuels, both coal and natural gas. Um, Australia is the, if you include our exports, we're the um, fifth largest um, producer of natural gas and, 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 and emitter of, nat of, of fossil fuels in the world, if you include our exports, which is obviously a huge problem for climate change itself. So, um, so that's the first theme. The second theme um, is, um, the, the we think there's going to likely be an increased push for extractivism of minerals in response to the renewable energy re revolution, and I just want to um, I'm going to show you another web another campaign here that I think is very impertinent, um, another PNG based campaign. If you just look at the question of copper. Um, mining companies, particularly in Australia, are telling us that they're going to be the saviors of the climate because they're digging up all the copper to meet the demand for the use of copper in um, electric vehicles, wind turbines, and, and other places. Um, so, um, in Australia, if you if you if you if you're in Australia, you'll be bombarded now with all of these advertisements to, um, where companies are making this, uh, mining companies are making this claim. And if we look at copper, copper is a huge problem. It's often found with gold in, in many parts of the Pacific. And, we're, we're, and we, we, we've already heard about the story of Bougainville this morning, but we're seeing that it is one of the major minerals that international mining companies with the support of governments are looking to extract in order to make profits for their shareholders, let's be honest. And um, there's, I think, really serious questions that need to be asked about where, how, how much copper we really need and where we're going to find it from and how much can be recycled. But just looking at a couple of examples, there's the, the there's the planned Frida River mine um, in 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 the CPIC and to which this campaign, the Save the CPIC campaign, is all about. You have um, an Australian-based company now, Chinese-owned, called Pan Ost, looking to uh, essentially um, start one of the biggest copper mines in the world um, on the tributary to one of the most precious rivers in the region. And the Save the CPIC campaign is dedicated to. Uh, preventing and stopping that that mine going ahead, and uh, you know, very much led by our partners, Project CPIC, which who are the indigenous voice on the ground um, to trying to protect their river and their way of life. We also have um, another example in PNG, which is the Wapi Golpu mine in Morobe Province, um, which uh, so Frida River mine hasn't received environmental approvals. So the the Wapi Golpu mine has recently received environmental approval, so that's an even more urgent. Uh, struggle and um, again Jubilee is working with with Cellcor, the Environmental Lutheran Church in Morobe um, to to see what we can do to really have a discussion about whether it's necessary for that mine to go ahead and, and particularly the damage that that um, could potentially do to both the land and the oceans because there's planned um, deep sea tailings disposal there. Uh, Bougainville's already been mentioned another area that we work on I think um, uh, Catherine might uh, include um, in the chat some of the links to um, some of the other um, work on extractivism that, that Jubilee is doing in supporting communities. Uh, a final mention, a final theme that I want to pick up on is, is the question of extraction. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, is the question of extraction and resilience. So climate change um, is making communities more vulnerable all over the Pacific as we know. 
and thoughtless extraction without regard to the impacts on, uh, on the environment will increase and, and worsen these vulnerabilities. And just a quick example on that from Fiji is the plans to increase black sand mining in Fiji. We've, we've seen the, uh, the Amex Resources um, black sand mining project in, in Bar province. Um, we've seen the plans for another company, Dome Gold Mines, to black, do black sand mining on the mouth of the Sikatoka River, both on Viti, Viti Levu. Uh, there's, a, there's another report that we've done with our partners, Caritas and FCOS Fiji, um, on these called the line in the sand. It just, just came out last month. And uh, you know the connection to climate is of course, and we're seeing this in the bar is that these projects can really uh, has serious ecological impacts, particularly on mangrove popular mangrove and other eco, um, other environmental impacts. And mangroves that we know protect communities from the impacts of, of climate change or help protect. So so just rampant extract, extractivism, um, which has questionable economic benefits any, anyway, is going to decrease resilience. Um, I was going to talk about um, what we could do, but Patrick, do you, uh, I think my 10 minutes is up. Do you want me to have briefly talk a couple of minutes on that or should we leave that for the Q&A? Yeah, no, I think that's, it, it's a really helpful sort of sense you've given us, Luke, and let's maybe come back to it in the, in the Q&A in the discussion, okay. I think, but that, that very clear sense that, you know, one of the, the dangers perhaps around the, the, the sort of the need to move towards renewables to address climate change that way is going to actually increase uh, pressure, the demand for extractives, and possibly lead to the of indigenous peoples of communities on the ground that they'll come under more pressure that covid too it will perhaps uh, put more pressure on governments to see extractives as a source of income um, and so that, that would deter them from the action um, uh, that is necessary um, for work and it's very very helpful to hear some of the campaigns that are going on on the ground at the moment um, also and because I think that's a very practical thing that people have to look at in terms of how do we use the standards, how do we use mechanisms, but also how do we link up uh, so that we can act together on those cases and those issues. Um, I think the Save the Secret, Sepik campaign is a really good example of the linkage between human rights and, um, and the environment and indigenous peoples and climate change. And it's one where I think it's uh, uh, five UN special procedures, human rights special procedures, have come out and shared a statement of concern around the potential impacts of the Frida River mine in the Sepik, in the Sepik region. Um, and one of those special procedures in particular, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights has a big focus on promoting the application of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. If we could begin to share our knowledge of the different frameworks, the different laws, the different standards that governments have, uh, have committed to, then we can perhaps open up different pathways to action and very importantly to collaboration. That brings me uh, to our next speaker, our last speaker for the session, which is who is Lagapoivu Cheryl Jackson. She's the editor of the Pacific Environment Weekly. Um, she's a writer and an editor for Earth Negotiations Bulletin, a uh, Samoan journalist and scholar. She's been covering climate, chemicals and ocean processes for uh, the Earth Negotiations Bulletin um, and has a particular focus on environment, gender and human rights in small island developing states. Uh, and we're looking forward very much to hearing her voice today. She's contributed to the international media to try and make sure that Pacific voices get out there through um, news agencies like AP, AFP and Al Jazeera, but also for The Guardian and Pacific Environment Weekly. So thank you very much, Lagapoya. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Patrick. Hello for everyone. Um, while I'm trying to do this, um, I'd like to pay my respect to the chiefs of Fiji, to the organizers of this meeting, um, and as per cultural protocol. Thanks, Robert, for uh, inviting me to, to present 
I really wanted to first um, acknowledge the presentation that was made by Winnie Karisti. I really enjoyed that presentation. It was very compelling, and I think it was it was a very good um, presentation to sort of set the scene um, to what I will be speaking on as well. And I reached out to Robert to um, integrate the journalist perspective in this very important forum because I feel that's always something that's missing um, when it comes to the discussion of human rights uh, issues in the Pacific, but also environmental rights. So in, you know, this is a crucial topic for the Pacific Island and indeed it crosses into the work of journalists and media in the Pacific region. In 2009, I established the Pacific Environment Weekly, an environment news syndicate in Samoa to strengthen the reporting of environmental issues in my home country. This was in response to an earlier realization that our people were impacting, um, were directly impacted um, by climate change and the impacts of climate change. Yet, this did not somehow translate to the pages of our newspapers or in the words on the airwaves or on television. So in 20, and this was also something that was common throughout the Pacific region. In 2010, I looked at this issue in Solomon Islands, in Fiji, in Cook Islands, and in Tonga, and found that over the period of a year, say there were a thousand stories covered by Pacific journalists on different issues like crime, health, uh, environment, um, or politics, I found that less than 5% of all coverage by these newspapers were on environmental issues. And for me, this was a very powerful finding because if we're truly impacted by, by climate change and if our lives as Pacific Islanders were affected in the way that we see, um, then shouldn't it be worthy of news? Um, shouldn't it be worthy of coverage by journalists? So I then set out to increase this coverage by creating this uh, publication, but also by assisting, um, by bringing international organizations uh, that focus on environmental journalism into the Pacific to train and educate Pacific journalists on how to better report on our people and the impact that the climate crisis had um, on our people. So in 2005, I was editor of Newsline, a national newspaper. Um, so this is a demonstration of how, how like covering environmental issues directly impacted um, my work as a journalist and as a human rights defender. So as editor of Newsline, a newspaper, um, I covered a story about uh, a tourism development in Samoa at the Taumasina Resort. And this development, it was a man-made island, and there was an environmental impact assessment that was made, um, done for the development. But somehow, uh, against the rules of the Ministry of Environment to publish and for EIA to be public, this one was not public. Um, this one was very much hidden somewhere. Um, and despite various attempts through, through various official channels and unofficial channels, this EIA remained, um, you know, uh, blocked or remained hidden by those who had the EIA. So I did a three-part series on the environmental impact of this development. And in the final part of my series, I managed to get a hold of the EIA and names of people who approved the development who shouldn't have approved the development at the time. And the night before we were meant to publish the last piece of the of the story, my office was burnt down, um, and our printer was burnt down. Um, the whole thing was went up in flames, which prevented us from publishing the third part of the series, and further just prevented us from publishing altogether. This was a direct um, direct threat to an attempt to uncover environmental harm, um, and especially environmental so harm on a community that lived in that area, and that were going to be harmed as a result of this development. So the response by the public was shock. 
and my publisher requested that I stop the story and never write it again. So it's never been written. Um, in addition to the fact my laptop was burned in the building, uh, it wasn't. I wasn't able to to cover this issue. So there's always this um, hesitation by journalists to identify ourselves as human rights defenders, and this is primarily due to the fact that we prefer to be objective and independent. So there's no direct line that the journalist can create between um, being a defender of human rights uh, or environmental rights or both um, to that of the work that you do. So there is that hesitation, which is why you wouldn't necessarily see media as part of the human, greater human rights dialogue. Um, yet, uh, media freedom and freedom of expression is very much, you know, a part of our human rights and set of it. So, uh, just as a quick, quick um, highlighting what environmental journalism is, it's a process of covering issues related to environment, nature, and the way people and governments, among others, interact and uh, discuss this interaction between government and nature and also people and nature. We in the Pacific are living in a defining moment um, in environmental change and shift. This is the reality that Pacific Islanders face. And Pacific journalists not only have a professional but a moral obligation to report on it as an islander. For indigenous Pacific Islanders, environmental journalism is absolutely key in understanding how we are impacted by the climate crisis and actions of developed countries. Pacific Island journalists need to tell the stories from perspective of Pacific Islanders. So often when climate change is, is covered, it's covered by journalists who don't necessarily have an understanding of how climate change impacts people in the villages. How does it impact the farmer or the fisherman or the woman who has to ensure that her nine children are fed and depend on, who depend on the land to feed her children. Um, you know, how does that impact their lives? And these are the stories we don't often see. So I don't know if um, people recall, but the Secretary General of the United Nations traveled to Tuvalu in, to Tuvalu in uh, about two years ago. And there was a front page, and I'm just going to share this screen now. The front page of Times Magazine um, that came out, so they flew. There was a big uh, contingency of UN and media who went to Tuvalu. And while they were in Tuvalu, they you know, he did the, the usual um, outreach and just share this. If you can see that now, Patrick, you can see that? I think that is a yes. So yes. while they were there, the front page of the Time Magazine was here, the story on the left, and it was the SG in standing on the shores of Tuvalu. His very expensive leather shoes were underwater and he was in this suit. It was a very compelling image. Um, and certainly it sold a lot of uh, magazines for time. But the concerning thing for me as a Pacific Islander and as a Pacific Island journalist was that the chosen picture to depict the impact of climate change on people of the Pacific was of a European man in a suit on the shores of a Pacific island, which was at the forefront of climate change. And standing merely, you know, 100 meters away from him while that story, that photo was being shot, were Pacific, were two Valuans who actually have to move their whole, all their household items um, several months in a year, uh, on an annual basis even, um, from rising tides people who were actually truly impacted by climate change were ignored in the way that this particular story was covered. So in my view, Pacific Island journalists have this moral obligation to report um, on climate change, um, but also to report it from the lenses of indigenous communities, because I feel that's always missing 
um, and it's something that should be highlighted more often than not. So I'm just going to wrap up here, Patrick. Thank you so much for your patience. But my advice um, to organizations who are working in this area, um, who are wanting to really highlight the key role that journalists play uh, as human rights defenders is to involve journalists in your work, to train journalists where you can on the issues that you work on, um, and also call journalists into account uh, when they misreport on the rights of indigenous communities, on environmental rights, and on human rights. Because it's only through those uh, learning from those experiences that uh, journalists can truly cover these issues effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for that. That's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a very, uh, yeah, I think a, a very inspiring presentation and uh, one very relevant for the rest of the discussions over the next uh, two days. And I think you really well drew out the important role of journalism in terms of uh, shining a spotlight, but the responsibilities of all this to make sure that uh, those voices can be heard and that journalists uh, covering sensitive environmental and human rights stories are safe in doing so. And it's another area in which there is the linkage between um, environment, environmental human rights defenders and, and human rights and human rights standards and mechanisms are linked. Um, so thank you very much for that sharing. Um, we've had a lot of chat and I think a lot of interest in, in the, the column um, and we'd like to now open the floor for some discussion. So please do use the chat room, but I might now um, go to some of the questions in the in the chat um, and we've had one from uh, Julio Fabris about what are the main challenges for indigenous peoples in the Pacific and how they're being addressed for example in South America indigenous communities are threatened by multinational corporations and governments aren't protecting the communities uh, in the way that they should I think this is a particular area that um, that Luke's organization, Jubilee Australia, has been looking at in relation to Australia and what is Australia doing to try and make sure Australian based corporations uh, respect human rights, respect environmental rights, and Indigenous peoples' rights. So we might go to Luke first to elaborate on some of the areas he presented on and then open up to the floor. And Winnie, I think it would be really interesting to hear from you also on the uh, Indigenous peoples' rights challenges across the Pacific. So, Luke. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, yeah, great question. And um, I'm really um, um, pleased that it came up because I was hoping to cover it in my presentation, but I ran out of time. Uh, so, you know, I think the first thing to say is obviously um, domestic laws. That, I mean, so, so many of the examples I mentioned, we are seeing the, the, the communities we work with who are protesting against um, or, or seeking to have their rights of consent um, um, exercised and also pro often protesting against the imposition of things against their consent um, are subject to threats of um, either either by the company or by local authorities, you know, government authorities, police, um, what have you, are threatened with um, with, with 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 real or actual um, violence um, or imp or implied threats, and so it's it's a hugely important issue. Um, obviously, domestic laws. Um, in country, whether it would be in Fiji or, 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 or PNG or, or Samoa or whichever country we're talking about, are the first line of defence. If there's a st and, and strong civil society like uh, like a point for mentioned, where there's coverage on media, is that's the first line of defence. But the second line of defence has to be, um, we feel, accountability of the corporations in their home country of multinationals that are doing this. Um, there needs to be accountability in the home country as well to bolster that first line of defence. Um, we presently don't feel um, that in um, OECD countries and other rich nations like Australia that we have strong enough mechanisms to hold multinationals to account in the host countries. Um, so tightening these mechanisms is an absolutely vital way of sending a message to companies that you just can't do this. You can't mess around with the rights um, of, of people who are fighting that. Um, when it comes to um, what mechanisms currently exist, really the, the only real mechanism we have um, in Australia and in other countries is the OECD mandated national contact point system. 
which is a sort of a complaint, sort of relatively often informal complaints mechanism. Um, we feel that although there are var there's a variation in, in the strength and um, um, effectiveness of these national contact points, um, we feel that these, this mechanism is not strong enough, particularly in Australia, which is very much focused on negotiations um, with the company. If the company doesn't want to go and want to negotiate, you've got nowhere to go. I mean, the other problem is that there's no investigative power in many of these national contact points. There's no ability to imply, to apply sanctions against companies that don't follow the recommendations or the directions of, of the national contact points. So from our point of view, um, we either need a massive reform of this NCP system, um, which is, a, I mentioned, uh, an OECD um, mandated um, institution, or really we need to look at what other, some other companies like Canada are doing. Um, they've recently established or in the process of establishing a human rights um, ombudsman, ombudsperson. And that, that's the sort of thing, something with, with more teeth and with more ability to, um, to have an impact. The other ideas that's been talked about and some European countries are looking at are at sort of due diligence laws for companies that um, engage in human rights abuses. So there's a, it's a very complex topic. I won't, I won't uh, take up too much time, but essentially um, countries that host multinationals have a lot of work to do, including Australia. Okay, thank you, Luke. And, and there are, it's an area in which the obligations of of governments are becoming increasingly well defined and there is a, a, a sort of a move to tighten and strengthen regulations through a sort of movement around getting an international treaty on business and human rights. Uh, but the, the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights is also very busy and active, including in the Pacific, to try and promote uh, the responsibility of government to protect uh, people, Indigenous peoples as well, from the impacts of corporations. Um, so there's a lot in this space, there is a lot happening. Um, like if, if, could I come back to you and ask how you find that sort of that sense of the understanding of the obligations of companies or of governments in relation to the environment in Indigenous peoples? How do we build awareness? And how, how, what challenges do you find at this moment when the Pacific in a way is being spotlighted because of the impacts of climate change? How can we help to amplify the voices from the people of the Pacific? How can people support the work that you're doing? Thank you, Patrick. Um, so I think the issue is that uh, I think it's, it's a really important question. The issue, the biggest issue as to why some Pacific journalists don't cover the stories um, as it relates to companies and government's responsibility to the Pacific Islands. For instance, Australia having to step up or China's role in environmental degradation on the ground um, really comes back to advertising. So a lot of media spaces are sponsored by, um, by companies. Uh, so for instance, um, you know, in Papua New Guinea, a lot of the media is sponsored, media pages are sponsored by the mining companies. So therefore, um, it does go against the interests of media owners to criticize uh, some of the, the practices. Um, so in, in Samoa, you'll find that China has the soft diplomacy with uh, media companies, where they invite journalists to China on a really nice press junket. Um, and through those ways, um, it's not direct, uh, but journalists are in, in a way they are, I wouldn't say suppressed, but there is certainly um, no incentive to really delve into some of the stories uh, in relation to, to the um, very harmful environmental practices that some of these governments and countries engage in, sorry and companies engage in. But for journalists who can cover these stories um, and who are not uh, threatened or in fear of their lives as a result, the best thing to do is press releases are always a good way to ensure that journalists cover your issues. Um, know the journalists who cover climate change and Pacific Islands in bigger publications. And so reach out to them directly. For Pacific Island journalists, um, you know, I've trained a lot of journalists in Vanuatu, Fiji, and Samoa, and the 
biggest issue is we have smaller um, newsrooms and there's not many journalists that report on all the issues that need to be covered. And environmental stories require time to research and require access to expertise that may not be available on the ground. So make yourself available if you're an expert on a particular issue, reach out to the journalist, have your story ready, and basically you're handing the story over. Um, so that way the journalist doesn't have to spend too much time um, on one piece, uh, but at the same time you're getting your issue covered. I hope that makes sense. That's very practical tips there as well for people working in this space. So thank you very much. I should ask uh, Mason Winnie, did you want to add anything around these the, these issues of the what are the main challenges for indigenous peoples in the Pacific? Uh, issues of accountability of corporations, um, and how do we collectively make sure that Pacific voices are heard at this time? Earth and House Rules, Patrick. If government is in on it, I didn't say that. <laughs> and we are fighting against, you know, a brick wall. And uh, those two are two, uh, two examples that uh, we have keen on um, working with. That's the Bar River sand mining, because it's in one of our rich to reef uh, areas. And just lately, Rusi and I last week, uh, joined the group uh, for the re uh, sand mining at the Singatoka River mouth. And uh, we not only fight uh, against the corporations, we are fighting against uh, government to a certain extent, if they've already approved. And, um, you know, the, the worst case scenario, look at um, uh, what uh, our, our journalist uh, has shared from um, from Langi that uh, their office was burnt down. I will not say any more here. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Thank you. Um, Pat, if I could just add to what uh, Winnie was saying, uh, specifically for us uh, at IUCN, uh, we take a more consultative approach to try and work with government and try and influence uh, government's <clears throat> direction in some of the issues we're discussing. And I think if uh, I can perhaps let the cat out of the bag, uh, Maria, if you don't mind, uh, one of the issues that is going to be discussed at the uh, Oceania Environmental Law Conference is the proposal for a regional green bench that will deal with some of these issues that we are talking about. Uh, again, it will be uh, discussions with the governments of the region, uh, NGOs and communities, on how do we uh, take this proposal forward to, to ensure some of the protection that we're talking about is enshrined in our national policies and our laws. Thank you very much. That's, that's very helpful, Mason. And uh, I think, you know, hopefully that will be well covered also in the, the, the conference and the initiatives coming out of it will be well covered by the media in the region and more broadly, because I think it's how we promote knowledge and understanding of these different developments uh, can really, it, well, it feeds into the Talanoa process, I think, hopefully, and, and through sharing our knowledge and experience, different initiatives, different perspectives. Um, we can generate the kind of action that is necessary. I hope. We, we, I'm sorry to say, uh, we're coming close to the end of our time together this morning, but it's, it's also a sense that the conversations have begun um, or they've continued from other forums into this. And then this workshop has been structured in a way that a lot of the issues that have come up this morning, we'll go into further depth with, and there's an opportunity for, for more discussion. So I hope that everyone will be able to join those sessions. I'm reminded that there's a session tomorrow on children, youth, environmental, and human rights defenders at 11 a.m. Fiji time. And I hope there we can pick up a question from one of our uh, uh, participants this morning, Mia Krishna, about how we encourage participation of children in terms of their voices to be heard in all areas. And in that regard, I would just like to share that there is a new uh, general comment from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and they supervise the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which every Pacific Island government has shared, uh, has, has signed on to. 
And there's a new general comment which sort of elaborates how climate change is impacting on children their rights as children to be involved and participate in the discussions that will affect them more than older people like myself. And um, so I think we'll hopefully pick up from that. And just to note that there was a, a recent uh, court decision here uh, in Australia where the court found that the Australian government had an obligation to consider uh, the, the um, the welfare of children um, and uh, in relation to climate change, that they had a duty of care in relation to children. And that needed to be factored into their decisions about uh, approval of coal mines and other developments. And it's seen as one of a number of significant uh, developments in this area. Uh, there are court cases being taken to the European Court on Human Rights in relation to climate change and a landmark uh, decision, uh, again, very recently in the Netherlands in relation to the obligations of Shell to uh, meet the Paris climate target. So I see in the discussions, both in the Pacific, but globally, that sense of human rights, the environment and climate change are really coming together. And this workshop is very timely. And uh, I thank, again, UNEP and OHCHR, our panelists, for this discussion and the forum and for helping us to think about how we can move together.